Melissa, right, here's her bio. Um, she's a writer and head of show type person of lit scene called Beat the Dust. She also runs Beat the Dust TV and Beat the Dust Bookshop, which is an online one-stop shop for the best literature from indie presses worldwide. Melissa's work has been widely published. Visit beatthedust.com. It's quite good. Her photo is by Chris Cook, also of nosugar.com. Good evening, Brighton. Oh. <laughs> I, had to do that. I have to say, in the sound check, I actually took the microphone out so I could you know, continue this illusion in my head that I'm Patty Smith doing, actually playing Brighton and mind reading. Okay, um, I'm going to read this story, and I wrote it when I was living in South London, and uh, I used to spend most of my time, it seemed, um, at a bus stop on Wandsworth Road waiting for buses that never actually came. And this was the inspiration, really, for it. Um, this picture is actually fantastic, the brilliance of which you'll be able to notice when I read the story, because it really does reflect some of the key things that are going on in the story. Let me get going, then. It's called Cockeyed. Annie leans forward on her stick, watching the tiny tumbleweeds of black hair cartwheel past the bus stop. They're coming out the door of OJ's, the barbers on Wandsworth Road. She pushes the thick bifocals up her nose with the bunched fist of her hand, then leans down closer, eyes squinting. Well, I never did, she says, looking round for someone to tell in the empty bus shelter. Like seeing someone's life pass before your eyes. She prods the balls of hair with the rubber bung end of her stick. Not that I can trust my eyes as far as I can throw them these days, she says, taking off her specs. Nothing wrong with my ears, though. Got ears inside my eyes. She breathes a frozen pond on each lens. Hear things I'd rather not, private things, like the fellow next door with his lady friends. She rests her head back against the root map. Lovely fella, black. Not married, of course. Don't seem to go in for it much these days. She looks up at the speechless grey sky pressing down on the parade of shops opposite. Fifty-two years me and Jack were married. He said to me once, Annie, he said, we've been happily married, haven't we? I answered him, of course, squeezed his hand and fed him the rest of his porridge. A 77 pulls up at the stop, engine grumbling. She smiles at the driver, her thin red mouth like jam bleeding from a cheap Victoria sponge, then waves him on with a stick. 52 years, she says, looking at the watch lashed to her wrist. For the past few years, it has forgotten what comes after three o'clock. It was Jack's watch before they archived him in Lambeth Cemetery. Yes, I've got ears inside my eyes. He's at it for hours sometimes, black fellow with his lady friend, she says, gripping a stick. Quite acceptable these days, of course, putting yourself about a bit. Wouldn't have minded a change from Jack, I'll be honest with you. Wouldn't have minded a black man come to that, you know, just to see, just to see how I'd get on. <laughs> she plucks the hair stuck to the end of her stick. So dark and wiry, she says, rubbing it between her fingers. Not like mine, all thin and fly away now, mine. Used to have a good head of hair once. A real looker I was, turned many a young man's head in my day. She fluffs a cloud of pale hair. Face like a fairy tale ending, Jack used to say. She presses her hand to her cheek. Not now, though, not after the stroke. Face like someone's pulled a tablecloth out from under it now. You say something? Annie jumps and looks round. There's a girl stood next to her. Annie watches the girl pull out her earphones. Can't hear a fucking thing with these in, yeah? She pops a full stop with her gun. What you say? Oh, don't mind me, lovey, says Annie, taking in the girl's bare thighs and tight t-shirt. Miles away I was, talking to myself. You wanting the 77, because it's just gone. And the 87. <laughs> Shit, says the girl, and her voice burned black at the edges. She looks down Wandsworth Road. Fuck! The girl pulls out a mobile phone and starts barking into it. How confident she is, thinks Annie, fiddling with the hem of her cardigan. She looks at the swallow tattooed on the girl's midriff and feels suddenly nostalgic, nostalgic for the girl she never was. 
Lovely to be able to grow up in your own skin like that, not caring what people think of you. Boyfriend's going to come pick me up, yes, says the girl, snapping her phone shut. Poxy bus, is it? Never one when you need one. Yes, yeah, but like policemen, says Annie, and nods her header up at the road opposite. I did see a pair of them when I was sat here yesterday, though, over there by the Tennessee fried chicken place. Looked like they were holding hands. Yeah, you see all sorts sat here, I can tell you. Pretty, she says, pointing a stick at the girl's tattoo. A hairball drops off the rubber bung and floats away. Hurt, did it? Bit, says the girl, still looking across the road. Two coppers? Holding hands yet? Fucking weird is that? Oh, don't mind me, lovey. Brain forgets what it thinks sometimes, says Annie, taking off her specs and rubbing her eye with her fist. I envy you, you know. I do. I envy you, young girls, today. It's like... It's like you're living my share of a freedom I wasn't allowed. A blue golf with a suck-me spoiler pulls up at the bus stop. The girl climbs in the front seat, takes hold of the man's face and kisses him violently. That's it, like That's it. You live your life, lovey, Annie shouts over the revving of the engine. No one ever died of young age. The car screeches away and heads down towards Vauxhall, baseline pulsing out the back window like an ECG. Annie swallows, feeling words catch in her throat, whole sentences of them buttoned up to her neck. A gust of wind rattles the shelter. She turns her head and listens. Footsteps, heavy boots loping along the pavement. Leaning forward, Annie looks up the road towards the Beaufoy bar. A man is walking towards her, a black man, skin shiny as patterned leather. Big woolen hat, red, gold and green, nodding to the beat of his steps. Annie struggles to her feet, squinting right at him. Her stomach has turned to sand and is falling towards her ankles. Eventually, a grin like an open wound appears in the powdered folds of her face. Well, I never did, she says, wiping her mouth. He's standing in front of her now, smiling at, down at her from his six feet of tall, smiling down at the frail old lady laughing so much she has to sit down. Oh, lovey, I nearly fell out my pants, she says, <laughs> hand pressed to her chest. Thought all my Christmases and birthdays had come at once. She points at his dreadlocks, which are so long you can see them hanging between his legs. I thought it was your cock! <laughs> <laughs> okay, just a few thank yous. First of all, I want to thank... <laughs> <laughs> First of all, I want to thank Joe Horsman for, for organising this event. I think it's fantastic to support um, underground literature, which I like to call it, in this way. So thank you very much for inviting me along. And I also want to thank Chris Cook for this photograph, and also for not photographing a massive cock for me to stand in front of. Because <laughs> that would have been slightly embarrassing. Um, and also for you for listening. Thanks very much for coming out on this wet Tuesday. Thanks.